What up, y'all? It is I, the great one himself, Seneca Libertarian Society, C-Y-N-L-I-B-S-O-C.com on the interwebs. It is a great big series of tubes, and we need the government to regulate the tubes. Otherwise, who's going to build the roads? I'm supposed to be writing, but I keep getting distracted, so I'm just going to do an anarchy moment. If this is This is... Yeah, this is just pure stream of thought bullshit. All right, so first of all, I just... <laughs> oh, sorry. Now, <laughs> it's early in the morning. I'm almost finished with coffee. Anyway, I just went and took a shit. And I know you really care about that because you turned into this tuned in. You turned in. You tuned in to this podcast in order to hear about my bowel movements. But I went and took a shit, and of course, as I always do, I sat there and I thought to myself, why the hell do we call it taking a shit when you fucking leave the shit? You leave the shit and you flush it. Which led me to think about, man, aren't flush toilets really fucking awesome? I mean, seriously, if we didn't have indoor plumbing and flush toilets, think how much life would suck. Which led me to thinking about how people romanticize the past. And, I mean, there's, there's, I'm not saying that's a terrible thing to do. I'm just saying you got to think about it logically sometimes. I mean, I certainly I romanticize the past sometimes also. You know, yeah, back in the good old days when we had to walk uphill to get to the outhouse. Anyway, which led me to think about the people who do the like medieval reenactments and stuff like that, right? And they're like, oh yeah, living in the medieval days is so wonderful, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you do realize they didn't have flush toilets, right? You, you, do you realize that? I mean, I know you're at your Renaissance fair and you got some porta johns over there, but do you realize that back in the 14th century, they really didn't have porta johns? The guy didn't show up every day with a big truck and vacuum them out and put new chemicals in them. Which then led me to think, welcome to my mind. See, all of this happens in my brain in the span of like five seconds. Now imagine, this is a, this is a five second chunk that I'm telling you about. Now imagine my entire day is like this and you'll understand sometimes why I am the way I am. So then, and of course in addition to the reenactments, there's also the role-playing gamers, like the Dungeons and Dragons, and all this sort of stuff. This popped into my brain. So then it occurred to me, because as I've always said, when you know we here in the future, we look at where we're at, and somehow or another we think, and, and understandably, right? I mean, it's like with with science and with the, I always say this about the global warming wackos, you know, they, everybody, we look at the way we are right now, the things we believe right now, the scientific knowledge we have right now, and we think, oh, this is it. You know, just like whatever, you know, a thousand years ago when people thought the earth was the center of the universe. I mean, to them that made sense and there was no way for them to conceive anything otherwise, right? Before, you know, whatever theories people had before they understood atoms and all this other stuff. So the point is, whatever time you're in, the conventions of that time are what you look at as being a sort of absolute truth. And even when they do change around us, they, we don't really notice it because the change is happening very, very slowly. And because we're in it, like for us, well, I shouldn't say for us, for those of us who were alive when the Soviet, well, it's not even really a good example because there's so much propaganda around this. But for people who who were in the Soviet Union when the Soviet, or, or for people who were in Germany when the Berlin Wall came down, that's, for them, it was sort of this gradual transition that they lived through, whereas people who look at it remotely have a different take on it. Okay, so the point I'm getting to is that 
100 years in the future, people will look back on us, and as I've said before, they're going to look back on us, and they're going to laugh at some of the stupid shit that we believe. Like, you know, and I, the, here's the thing. I can't predict what they'll be laughing at in 100 years. You know, I mean, I feel good about predicting that they'll be laughing at the global warming wackos for believing that you know, the environment was changing because of Republicans and that if we only raised taxes, we could prevent the weather from changing. They'll be laughing at that. And you know, but if, if we're lucky, they'll be laughing at the idea that 100 years ago, you had to get permission from the government to get married. If we're lucky, they'll be laughing at the idea that people thought only the government could build roads. If we're lucky, they'll be laughing at the idea that we had a government that people a hundred years ago actually needed a man sitting in the White House to like tell them what to do, tell them what kind of food to eat, and force them to buy health care and all this other stuff. So if we're lucky, those things will happen. That's what they'll be laughing at. It's equally likely that they'll be laughing at us because we had cell phones that were not issued to us by the government and they'll be laughing at us because some people actually owned firearms and you know they'll be laughing at us because some people were allowed to have more money than others who knows but the point is see now I'm digressing because that never happens the point is, I took the shit, right? I flushed the shit. I thought about how, man, indoor plumbing sure is great. Then I thought about people who idealize the past, romanticize the past, rather, I should say. And then I thought about the people who do the historical reenactments and the people who do the role-playing games. And then it occurred to me, 100 years from now, or maybe 500 years from now, maybe even 1,000 years from now, I don't know, at some point in the future, will there be historical reenactments of like the 1980s. Hey, where are you going this weekend? Oh, I'm going to the I'm going to the Decade of Greed festival. Oh, wow, isn't that the festival where they reenact the 1980s? Yeah, man, it's really cool. You take out all of your internet implants and you get out of your cyber suit. And you like walk around and you pretend you're a stock trader. <laughs> I mean, I'm just throwing this out. They're good. <laughs> Will there be role playing games? Although I suppose a thousand years from now, it'd probably be some kind of virtual simulator role playing game. You wouldn't do it with dice and books, you'd probably do it plugged into a computer system. But, you know, will there be renaissance fairs but instead of going back to the middle ages well we're going to go to the renaissance fair and re-experience the year 2000 <laughs> i'm just saying it could happen all right there it is another thing that happened this morning i'm watching i just watched the movie cat people not the shitty remake but the original Cat People. And then I'm watching the Cat People sequel, which I don't even remember offhand what it's called, like Return of the Cat People or More Cat People or Cat People Hit the Box Office Again to try to make more money off of a successful movie or something, something. So anyway, this is going to be about statism and how statists are so fucking blind and naive. This also ties into Stefan Molyneux, who always talks about how his daughter is great at spotting inconsistencies because children are good at spotting inconsistencies. And of course, this is why the average child, before they've been fucked up by public education, is smarter than any statist. And yes, this is an example from a movie, but the same sort of thing happens in real life. And Stefan Molyneux often talks about how his daughter will point out inconsistencies to him and call him on this sort of stuff. So anyway, in the movie, there's a little girl and she's got her parents and her parents are actually married to each other. Wow, what a concept. You, I love these old movies because in original cat people, they're like, 
well, you, but if you put your wife in the sanitarium, then you can't divorce her, you know? And it's like, whoa, you can't divorce somebody. What a concept. And it's like, they're like trying to figure out how to get a divorce because they want to get married. And it's just like, wow, people getting married. Oh, and it's hilarious. In the original Cat People, the guy protagonist, the girl protagonist, the cat girl, they get married. He marries her without having ever kissed her or having sex with her. And even after they're married, she thinks that if she kisses him or has sex with him, she'll turn into a cat and kill him. But he marries her without any sex, without any kissing. I'm just like, whoa, man. <laughs> I really got to suspend disbelief. Ah, old movies. All right, I love them, though. They're great. And Lana Turner is not in The Cat People, but Lana Turner is hot. All right, anyway. Focus. I got a lot of shit to do, so I need to fucking finish this and move on. In the Return of the Cat People movie, the little girl... It, I'm, I'm just going to condense all of this. So when the little girl is like three years old, Daddy tells her, Oh, this tree in the backyard, this is a magic mailbox because it's got a big hole in the tree, right? And if you put mail in the magic mailbox, it'll be delivered. All right, so flash forward three years, and Dad's like, hey, what did you do with the birthday invitations you were supposed to mail out? And she says, well, I put them in the magic mailbox. And he's like, okay, it's not really a magic mailbox. That was just a story. And she's like, oh, well, thanks for fucking lying to me about that, Dad, because now nobody's coming to my birthday party because you told me that was a magic mailbox, but you're a lying motherfucker, right? Which is why you shouldn't tell your kids Santa Claus exists because you're a lying motherfucker. So anyhow, they go in the house, they're doing the birthday thing. Nobody showed up for the birthday party because the invites didn't get mailed. So mom and dad and the butler and the little girl are having the birthday party with themselves and the butler brings in the birthday cake and the father says, blow out the candles and make a wish and it'll come true. And the girl says, wait a minute, you just told me that wishes don't come true. We just had this discussion about the magic mailbox and you said there's no fucking magic and the magic mailbox is not a fucking magic mailbox and that was just a story and now you're telling me if I blow out some candles on a cake and make a wish, the wish will come true. What the fuck are you smoking? And the father says, oh, well, but this is different. It's like, there it is. See, that's statism. When you say to a statist, if there is no government, people will figure out how to build roads. They will say to you, well, that's magical thinking. You, you, that, there's no way that will happen. Okay? So, no government, people figuring out how to build roads can't possibly happen. That's magical thinking. The same statist, however believe that the government can pass a law and provide health care for everybody in the United States. And when you ask them to explain to you exactly how that will happen, I'm not saying, you know, well, they, say, well, they passed Obamacare. No, no, no. Explain to me exactly how health care is provided for every single person. Explain to me how you... You know, how does this work? Exactly how much money is paid to doctors? How many doctors are there? Where do these doctors come from? Where are the hospitals located? Explain to me exactly how this works. And of course they can't because it's magical thinking. To them, to a statist, to believe that if you let a bunch of people figure out the solution to their own problems, and implement those solutions, to them, that's magical thinking. However, to a statist, when you say to them that a group of people will pass a law forcing an entire nation of millions of people to do something, and it will all work out perfectly, see, that's not magical thinking to them. To them, that makes perfect sense. Why? Well, that's different. It's just like the father's response with making a wish while blowing out the candles. He's full of shit. He knows he's full of shit. 
but he just responds, oh, well, this is different. And statists operate on exactly the same principle. Ask any statist to explain to you how making marijuana illegal will prevent people from smoking marijuana. Ask them to explain how making rape illegal prevents people from raping. Ask them to explain to you how the TSA actually makes it safer to fly on airplanes and prevents terrorism. And not just say, well, because the government said so, or because Obama's black, or whatever. Ask them to explain to you the exact process, step by step, by which this happens. And how much money it costs, and where the money comes from, and where the resources come from, and what the opportunity costs are, and all this other stuff. And of course, they can't do it. They just have this magical belief that their God, who's Saint Obama, this is why you know statists are like religious people. The religious people. Oh well, the yeah. I talked about this recently. We ask religious people why does why is there life on Earth? Well, because God made Earth for people to live on. Okay, that's not an answer. That's magic. When you ask a statist anything about the government, when you say we don't need the government to build roads. Well, we have to have the government to build roads. Now, the government, who's going to build roads? The government builds roads. Well, explain to me how the government builds roads. Well, I don't know. It's magic. It's just magical thinking. And yet they accuse anarcho-capitalists of being naive, of being idealistic. And yet, statists are people who believe that the government just magically creates health care for people. The government just magically builds roads. Finally, let me close with this. But inconsistencies. The point is, Unlike small children who can spot inconsistencies, the average statist cannot spot an inconsistency. They cannot spot the inconsistency that happens when they say to ANCAPs, you have magical thinking that could never work. And of course, the fact that they as statists have magical thinking, which oddly enough isn't working because you'll notice that in spite of marijuana being illegal, you can get it almost anywhere. In spite of rape being illegal, women still get raped. In spite of, you know, taxes out the wazoo being and money being dumped into public education, children are still stupider than shit. In spite of Obamacare, everybody on the planet doesn't get to go to a doctor anytime they want to immediately. Well, the planet, the United States. So the magical thinking... It doesn't work. All right. Yeah, welcome to my brain. Finally, let me go off of this before I go do... Apparently, what magazine is this? Oh, Vogue. Apparently, Vogue had on the cover of it... I missed this edition of Vogue, which is not a big deal. It had on the cover Kim Kardashian and... Kanye West. Apparently, I'm not into National Enquirer shit, so apparently they're getting married. I thought Kanye West was a gay fish, and they've got the photograph here. I'm going to tell you this. Kim Kardashian is not attractive, and her hands are almost as big as Kanye's. And when I first saw this picture and glanced at it, I thought this was two men. Kim Kardashian looks a lot like a man in this wedding dress. Just throwing that out. Anyhow, because I spend a lot of time ragging on women, I, I have to do this. I have to read this. So these are two letters to Vogue magazine about the cover photo with Kanye West and Kim Kardashian. And these letters are from women. Here's the first one. I must say the entire Kardashian feature was completely surreal. With her maddening materialism and his grandiose delusions, they may indeed be the quintessential media couple. 
As for Kanye's statement that Kim, quote, created something really powerful that the universe connected with, unquote, frankly, I am speechless. <laughs> and that's from Susan Crean in Washington, D.C. And yes, so apparently there's one intelligent woman in Washington, D.C. Here's the other one. This is from Beryl Kahn in New York, New York. She writes, I have been an enthusiastic subscriber for several years. That said, I was greatly disappointed in the decision to feature Kim Kardashian and Kanye West in the magazine. The former hardly qualifies as a suitable role model for young women. I hope to see less of national inquirer elements in vogue moving forward. <laughs> So, anyway, apparently there's a few women who read Vogue, Vogue magazine who aren't completely stupid. All right, that's that's me babbling in some anarchy moment shit for a Monday morning. And I got, there's four episodes of Stating the Obvious lined up that'll be coming out after this. You're going to get them on Wednesday, and then Monday, and then Friday, and then Wednesday. The last three are a three-part series where I read an article from, I think it's Vogue or it's L, one of those, about a mangina who is a mangina. Anyway, if I'll be ragging on manginas severely in those three episodes. Come back, check them out. And between all of those, I'll be dropping some anarchy moments on your candy asses. All right, jabronis, The Rock says this. Go out there, kick some ass, take some names, be an ANCAP, fuck statist.